I'm joined today by my colleague, Managing Director Tony Carfang, as well as today's panelists, Michelle Price, the Associate Policy and Technical Director with the Association of Corporate Treasurers, Debbie Cunningham, the Chief Investment Officer with Federated Investors, and Roger Merritt, Managing Director with Fitch Ratings. Before we begin, I remind everyone who's registered for this session that in a day or two, you're going to receive a copy of this presentation and a link to the recording. If you wish to ask questions during our presentation, you can do so in the question box in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. We'll handle these questions offline in the coming days as well. So let's get started. Uh, as we always do, we like to set the stage and talk about the macroeconomic trends that are happening, which will inform our corporate cash decisions going forward. Uh, as we look at slide four, the story is climbing levels, accelerating levels, actually, of cash in this, in this uh, period. Uh, if you look at the U.S., we see a recent jump over the course of the year. And especially if you look, we're seeing the billion-dollar jump from December, our previous session, to this, uh, this March uh, period. We're going to discuss this more in just a moment, especially in context of reserves, which are also climbing, which we find very interesting. If you look at the UK, you see two times the cash levels during this series, effectively doubling uh, the corporate cash levels in the, the UK area with a slowdown every third corner. Uh, Tony Carfang and I were talking about this earlier. It's an interesting trend that's happening. Whatever Brexit eventually looks like, we, see, we feel like there's going to be a change that will be reflected potentially in the October 14th quarterly cash session, uh, a topic which obviously is going to come up when we get to our panel here in just a little bit. If you look at the Eurozone, a 2.5 times climb over the period from 1 trillion to about 2.4 trillion, solid line growth. And then the Japanese, of course, continue to move in that same direction. Moving on to slide five here. This is looking at, re at regression. And, and think about what this slide is saying. You know, this is a reflection of the macroeconomic events that are going on in these four jurisdictions and the underlying monetary and fiscal policies that inform those jurisdictions. They're all climbing at an accelerating level, but if you look at, especially if you look at the United States, you see a growth in that slope curve. If we look at the previous uh, quarterly cash, we saw that slope at about $17.5 billion a quarter, meaning that the, the cash level is climbing at $17.5 billion each quarter. Well, that's actually increased. That accelerating trend has gone up to 18.8. .8. That's a big deal. If you look at the UK and the Eurozone, those levels are, are both growing as well, but at a rate that hasn't significantly changed over the last few quarters. Over the last few quarters. And we ask ourselves, we've been asking ourselves this all week, and now we ask you to provide us some feedback with your thoughts. Will we even recognize a return to normal? What does normal look right, like right now when we see these, these trends accelerating as they're doing? Uh, and, and then you see Japan as well. Japan isn't necessarily the same kind of fit over time. It doesn't have the same uh, fit of slope. But that's due to, as we've discussed before, policy differences, macroeconomic differences. And our understanding is there, there just wasn't as much of a, of a hit from a monetary and fiscal policy uh, perspective, I suppose. Um, the, the, in reality, there just wasn't as much of a hit going into 2008, 2009, the financial crisis. So there hasn't been as much of a change over that time period. Everyone else was rising fast in 2000 and 2005 or six, So they're returning to a different normal. But again, the question becomes, what's normal look like? And again, we ask you for your feedback on that. Moving to slide six. Uh, this is cash as a percentage of GDP. It's how well we believe that cash is being uh, allocated in, in the, the jurisdiction. Um, it's still high, particularly outside the United States. You see, you know, the, the U.S. has a very, very small change in the trend of uh, cash on hand. It went from 11% in December to about 12% now. Um, we, you know, we talked about this during the last uh, cash briefing. Tony had testified a few months back on this, on our opinion as cash as a percentage of the GDP ratio being a measure of economic efficiency. The United States hasn't, isn't changing that much, uh, and really none of the jurisdictions have over the course of the last few periods. Uh, it's a slow climb, and uh, you know, again, we would be interested in hearing what you have to say about that. Uh, is the U.S. more efficient at capital and cash allocation? Is it a reflection of different regulatory structures, different balance sheets, other cultural or structural issues. We're more than uh, happy to hear your thoughts on that. 
As we look to uh, slide seven, this is showing correlations relative to nominal GDP for these, for these uh, major jurisdictions. Again, going back to our, my previous statement, the U.S. took a big jump here in cash relative to nominal GDP. This climb is about $10 billion. Uh, Eurozone and U.K. is a little less. Japan, again, is a separate story. But if you, if you look at these straight line growth, we were not expecting, and, and let's look at slide eight as, we, as I make this point, we were not expecting to see cash and reserves moving as they do. Um, for the U.S. alone, we're looking at a jump from 2.03 trillion, looking at the previous quarter, uh, 2.03 trillion to 2.3 from the previous quarter briefing. Now, we would have expected a shrinking reserve number uh, as you see, you know, froth in the marketplace, I guess, from uh, the Fed's, well, I guess Fed speak, as Debbie likes to say, um, as the Fed is uh, telegraphing what's going to happen, maybe not when, but what's going to happen regarding QE and other signals around interest rates and things like that. We weren't expecting to see cash and reserves going up in the same way, and we have to ask ourselves, why is this shooting up like this? Um, the Bank of England jumped from 205 uh, to 251 billion. Uh, we, uh, you know, going back to the same topic around Brexit, uh, which we'll talk about in a little, a little bit more. Is the reserve trend reflecting Brexit concerns? We don't know the answer to that. Uh, I would opine that that probably is part of the case, but. I'm not a, not a central banking expert, so I'd be happy to hear everyone's thoughts there. Uh, the Eurozone continues to climb from 1.26 in the previous period to 1.44 trillion in this period. Uh, Japan as well is climbing. Um, now they have their recent moves to reduce their growth forecasts in the last few quarters, but this trend isn't that unusual. We think that in general, these reserves may be a response to uncertainty in the marketplace, but I could say that about anything. So that's not a very, you know, it's, it's not an expert opinion there. It's just, this is probably what's, what's going on here. Uh, again, before I hand it off to Tony, we would love to hear your thoughts on uh, any of these macroeconomic trends. So Tony, I'm gonna hand it off to you to speak for a few minutes on those trends, as well as what you're hearing regarding uh, US money market fund reform, which seems to be more and more of a common topic lately. Well, thank you, Kevin. Uh, let, let's go back to the reserve balances chart. Um, you know, for all that we hear in the marketplace about um, central banks scaling back or unwinding or at least decreasing their level of stimulus, uh, the numbers tell a very different story. And many of you may recall at the at our April cash briefing, we 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 took a look at that decline in the U.S. from 2014 through. Um, year end uh, 2016 and, and and we said at that point that looks suspiciously like the same slope of the decline in money fund uh, prime money market fund assets and we promised to take a deeper look at that now uh, and, and I'm going to show you a slide in a second, but then all of a sudden in this quarter we have a three hundred billion dollar spike uh, which obviously we need to figure out. One of the things that we did after last quarter's cash briefing, and we saw this trend, was to look at both bank reserves, and you see that in the blue line and the scale on the left, and we we plot that against total holdings by money market mutual funds of bank liabilities. And so what we're seeing is as assets left the prime funds, the scale on the right, as we've gone from you know, the, the $1.4 um, or, or whatever down to a much lower number now, we see over a uh, two-year period, quarter by quarter, almost a dollar-for-dollar dollar yeah. match. Now, our sense here, perhaps, is that uh, – as assets left money market funds, money market funds had uh, less capacity to buy bank deposit instruments, and as their holdings of bank deposit instruments uh, decreased, uh, banks decreased their reserves at the Fed. Uh, so, so in fact, it's, 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 this reminds me of like you know, back in the early 1980s. For those of you who remember the recycling of petrodollars, well, this is simply a recycling of uh, Federal Reserve stimulus, I guess. Uh, the, the 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 concern here 
is that how can a regulation like money market fund regulations have half trillion dollar impacts on the money markets? I mean, as corporate treasurers, these kinds of flows sloshing around um, impact the way you do business, the rates that you get, the spreads uh, in the marketplace, uh, the availability of credit. Uh, now we see a $300 billion increase, uh, and, and, and we just saw this in statistics that came out a couple days ago, so that's not on this chart. And um, it, it doesn't look like that the increase in U.S. bank reserves at the U.S. Fed has anything to do with money funds increasing their holdings of uh, bank deposit instruments, so we're going to be investigating that further. Now, I want to move on. Treasury Strategies uh, recently issued a paper called Money Fund Regulations, Winners, Losers, and Long-Term Consequences. Uh, and it's a report that, that we published. We circulated fairly widely and uh, also circulated widely on Capitol Hill and, in fact, uh, presented at a, at, at a meeting in the, in the White House a few weeks ago. Uh, Winners, losers, and long-term consequences. We are going to send everyone on this call a link to this paper. But let me warn you, of the 450 of you or so who registered for this call, only 12, as I've looked through the registration list, only 12 of you will find your, your organization in the winners column. So just be, be, be advised. Uh, what we see in the, in, in the top box here is over, over the course of the money fund uh, regulation uh, announcements and, and, and phase-in period, um, prime funds lost $1.1 trillion in assets and tax-exempt funds were cut in half, uh, losing $137 billion. Uh, these, these two funds uh, – invest in private sector instruments, uh, and, and prime funds in particular offer the best returns for corporate treasurers. Uh, the regulations made them uh, much less attractive. Uh, as, as, as corporate treasurers, many of you are uh, investing in prime funds or had been investing in prime funds and, and, and have left prime funds, so, so you're, you're losing return. You're, you're leaving money on the table as a result of these regulations. Um, Many of you also borrow, you issue commercial paper into prime funds, and, and you've lost that, that source of funds. So there's a huge disruption. Uh, and where did the money go? Well, it went into government and treasury funds. So basically, we're taking this out of the private sector and putting it into the pub public sector. The money is no longer available to fund private enterprise or communities, but rather to fund government programs, uh, federal government programs and initiatives. Uh, I presented this uh, in, 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 a, in a hearing in Congress, um, and I, th I think on both sides of the aisle, the, uh, the sense was this was not an acceptable outcome. Now, l l let me point out, our sense is that all this money, this trillion dollars that moved in, 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 into government funds, is not there permanently. This is just a resting place. You know, corporate treasurers, you know, uh, you know, because of the fluctuating net asset value and some other things, you moved out of prime and into government. But our sense, as we talk to our clients and as we do the math, uh, we don't believe this money is going to stay there. We think this is a resting place while you are waiting and seeing what happens to prime funds, what the spreads ultimately become. And our sense is that, except for money in sweep accounts, where for, for a bunch of reasons it will stay in government funds, except for the sweep accounts, uh, most of this money will either move back to prime funds or move out of money market funds altogether, perhaps back into bank deposits or separately managed accounts. Uh, you know, uh, most of us learned in school the, the concept of the efficient frontier, uh, which, which uh, shows the, uh, the landscape of the market and the best returns available for any level of risk or the lowest risk necessary to earn any given uh, level of return. And as, as, as we study this, government money market funds are not on the efficient frontier. Uh, Professor John Bilson, a good friend of Treasury Strategies, <clears throat> in a landmark 2007 uh, white paper, uh, showed why uh, government securities fall off the efficient frontier. And uh, his 
thesis, which he demonstrates very well, is that because regulations require entities uh, to hold government securities, like for collateral or reserves or liquidity or whatever, uh, that creates additional buying demand and additional utility uh, for for investors that they will trade off against yield. So corporate treasurers uh, who, who don't have those same kind of capital requirements or uh, reserve requirements, uh, if you invest in these instruments, you're not getting that extra utility and you're not getting the uh, extra yield. And in fact, the, the, uh, w w w when you look at uh, the tenets that he laid out, um, Dodd-Frank and Basel III simply put a big exclamation point behind John's findings. Uh, it's a fascinating piece of work. So the government funds take in an, an, an extra trillion dollars over this period. What did they invest in? And as we look at the, um, in, in the bottom chart, um, a quarter of it went to the Federal Home Loan Bank. The uh, government money fund holdings of uh, government and treasury fund holdings uh, uh, increased from 236 billion to 483 billion. Um, so what we see here is a recycling of mo not only a recycling of money out of the private sector into the public sector, uh, but in addition into the housing part of the public sector. And, you know, again, as we speak with members of Congress, it's uh, not their sense that this is the desired outcome. Now, in our winners and losers paper, we, we actually show the change in money fund holdings for, uh, uh, for, for, for many of you corporations. And here are a list of the 26 companies who have lost $100 million or more in funding from money market funds over that period. Uh, General Electric uh, has $9 billion less funding on an average daily basis, $9 billion on an average daily basis less funding from money funds. Now, that's not a problem for General Electric because uh, General Electric can, can, can go to a lot of different places and borrow the banks, the private markets, uh, um, a number of places. The problem is if you're not on this 26, if, you, if, if you're below that, chances are there's crowding out downstream and there is $1 trillion less available to uh, to be a source of, of, of funding for you. So, you know, if you have a less than perfect credit rating or if um, you, you, you don't have access uh, you know, to the top tier markets, there could be a crowding out or there, or there could be a higher rate. Uh, ditto on uh, municipalities. Here we show that municipalities across the state of California collectively have lost $17 billion in funding. Uh, frankly, this is a much bigger problem for, 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 for municipalities uh, because their access to capital markets is much more limited than a Fortune 500 corporate treasurer. So the, the, these are issues, and Congress has become uh, well aware of these issues, and, and I want to point out that, that, that there's hope. Um, that, that there's an effort underway to bring back prime and tax-exempt money market funds in Congress, and there is something that you need to do to help make this happen. The Consumer Financial Choice and Capital Markets Protection Act um, which is an interesting name to bring back prime taxes and money funds, Senate Bill 1117 and House Bill 2319 um, are, are currently uh, in Congress. Uh, the Senate bill has four sponsors and co-sponsors, and it's interesting, there are two Republicans and two Democrats. So it's a nice bipartisan way of, uh, of bringing the legislation forward. Uh, when we updated this chart yesterday, the House bill had 20 sponsors. As of this morning, it's now up to 21, and there are 11 Republicans and 10 Democrat uh, sponsors to the, uh, the, the House bill. What this bill does is allow money funds to opt in to become prime institutional or tax-exempt institutional once again. And if they opt in, they can maintain a constant net asset value, and they are not uh, – uh, they do not come under the liquidity fee uh, mandate of the uh, October money fund regulations. So th th there's obviously a lot of interest. Uh, these bills are gaining traction. Uh, I testified on this uh, earlier in the year. Uh, we're, we're, but I have to say one thing. As we meet with members of Congress about these bills, uh, 
you know, it's fascinating. We'll, we'll have these meetings, and the members and the staffs are all nodding their head yes, and then, uh, you know, eventually the member turns to, to his political aide and says, well, Joe, what are our clients, or what are our constituents saying about this? And Joe said, I don't know. I haven't heard from any of them. Now, they expect to hear from the trade associations. The AFP is behind this, of course, um, and many other associations uh, are, are behind this. But the members of Congress expect to hear from that. What they're not hearing is from their constituents directly. So we suggest two things here uh, to really help push this over the finish line. The first is to join the Coalition for Investor Choice. Uh, there's no cost for this. You, 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 you just sign up. This will help you stay informed. And we'll We'll invite you to participate in certain signatory efforts uh, that, that, that they might um, engage in from, from, from time to time. And secondly, you know, we would encourage you to contact your member of Congress. And at Treasury Strategies, we put together some sample letters for you and a protocol for identifying and getting an email into the hands of your members of Congress. This is something you can do under your corporate signature or, 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 or just individually. And if you go to the Q&A box in the right-hand corner of your screen and just type in the word Congress, uh, that will alert us that we need to get back to you with the instructions on how to do that. So. Uh, you know, there, there's hope here, and I think we're, we're, we're now at the point where uh, it, this needs a nudge over the finish line, uh, or as the minister would say, speak now or forever hold your peace. Thanks so much, Tony. Um, going into our panel discussion, uh, I'd like to introduce Debbie Cunningham, the Chief Investment Officer of Federated Investors, Roger Merritt, Managing Director of Fitch Ratings, and Michelle Price, the Associate Policy and Technical Director with the Association of Corporate Treasurers. Uh, before we start talking about, because you know, we spend a few weeks thinking about what's going to be relevant. We ask um, some of our typical corporate treasury audience members, and a lot of the feedback has been about global market volatility. Um, before we get to talking about the volatility in the marketplace, or, or lack thereof, uh, Debbie Cunningham, I want to start with you and, and piggyback on what Tony uh, was just talking about regarding money market fund regulation. Uh, when you and I spoke, uh, I believe it was a week or so ago, uh, we were talking about how money market form reform, it's just not easy to to simply reverse. Uh, maybe you could provide a little color around that. Well, um, absolutely. And, you know, the, the reason it's not easy to reverse is what Tony was just showing in the context of um, the slides that, that are up for this presentation, um, that being the massive outflow that has exited both the municipal and the prime money market uh, world and gone into the, the government money market world. So um, at this point, you've got prime assets of a little over 400 billion in the market. They had, you know, at their peak been 1.9 trillion, uh, and munis are 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 down um, around uh, 100, a little over 100 billion. Uh, you know, again, as Tony mentioned, half their their peak. So. When you have clients that potentially might be interested and now able to go back into one of those products, the product that they used to be in from a size perspective is drastically changed. So in many instances, you have you know, the size constraints now of the portfolios working against what would ultimately be um, the investment policies of the corporations or the firms that are looking to invest. So oftentimes people have, well, as part of their investment policy, I can't be more than X percent of a portfolio. Put a number in there, 3 percent, 5 percent, 10 percent, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And when that percentage used to be of a, you know, 10, 20, 30 billion dollar portfolio, you ended up with substantial allocate, substantial allocations to that product. Um, another part of the investment policy oftentimes says I don't, that, that a, a minimum investment size is X number of millions of dollars. Um, you know, let's say it's 25 million, 50 million, 100 million. Oftentimes, when you have a maximum of percentage allocation and a minimum investment size. 
with a fun product group now in the prime and the muni world, um, you know, drastically shrunk as it is, you end up with no, no availability, nothing that, that, that gets you, you know, to an available end product. Or maybe one or two products, but, you know, maybe historically you've been used to investing in, you know, six or seven or ten or diversification in some way, shape, or form. So you almost have to kind of think of it in the context of what might be sort of, you know, a, a, a market re-IPO of these products, you know, pick a date, you know, a month in the future and, you know, basically have all firms working to get their clients back into a product or, or, or a group of products on that date. And, right. and that's just, you know, that's difficult for a single company to undertake, let alone an industry, you know, where, where um, there are lots of different types of firms and competitors. Right. Yeah, that was something that you and I talked about. I remember the comment about, uh, you know, nobody, uh, at least none of the uh, audience on our call, wants to be 50% of any one of these uh, pools. You know, nobody wants to dive in the shallow end of a shallow pool, right? Um, Debbie, before I, I transition over to Roger, uh, we were also talking about uh, European money market regulations that are, are coming in, the U.K. market code. Maybe you could provide a little, a little color around what's going on in the U.K. as well. Sure. Um, very recently, the, the EU Parliament, um, just uh, the, 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 in, at the end of June, beginning of July, finally assigned and confirmed the dates for um, the, the, the money market, European money market regulation from an, an effectiveness standpoint. So uh, they go into effect three weeks after the date of the signature. I think that's now in another week or so. And ultimately, from an implementation standpoint, it's an 18-month time period, so that puts you into January of 2019. Um, the Europeans were, were uh, you know, kind of watched what happened in the U.S. and I think have taken, in my estimation, uh, a better route. Rather than having um, Basically, it's, a, it's an institutional marketplace over there, so pretty much institutional retail are already segregated. It's just institutional. So they didn't have to go down that route. And rather than taking a all institutional has to be in VNAV product, um, instead they came up with a concept that's called LVNAV, which is limited volatility uh, money funds, limited volatility price at money funds. So essentially what that means is the L, these LVNAV funds will continue to operate like a stable net asset value fund. So they'll be one pound or one euro or one dollar, whatever, whatever the, the, the currency denomination is. Um, and as long as when the shadow pricing for that product is done on a daily basis, it fits within a collar on either side of that one dollar uh, price, that one dollar amortized cost calculated price, um, then it will stay the one dollar NAV uh, calculated price, and as such, you know, remain a stable net asset value product. Now, what does that mean practically? Um, if you go back historically in time, um, at least from our product's perspective, and I think it's probably the same across the industry, you could maybe pick maybe one or two dates in a 40-year history where these collars would have been broken. So that's very unlikely uh, of an occurrence to, to, to happen. And as such, even though there's, you know, um, requirements around calculations and disclosure and informational content as to how these um, LVNAVs perform, uh, ultimately the end result is they'll look just like a stable net asset value product with a couple bells and whistles associated with them from a calculation standpoint. Yeah, which will be an interesting product should it, you know, come to uh, be an option, let's put it that way. Uh, Roger Merritt, Managing Director of Fitch Ratings. Um, you know, we just heard Debbie and, and, and Tony prior to that talking about both U.S. and, and European money market reform. Do, do you have any thoughts as far as, uh, I guess, options from both from Fitch's perspective as well as from individual investors, well, sorry, corporate investors' perspectives and, and timeframes around that? Well, I mean, um, a couple of things. Uh, as it relates to the U.S., um, setting aside, you know, the, the bills that are in the House and the Senate, um, but assuming the status quo remains, you know, um, we, 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 we think that, call it $1.2 trillion of money that's moved from prime money funds to government money funds, um, 
you know, we think most of that is sort of permanently lost to the prime universe. So, you know, I, um, you know, we don't think a lot of that uh, corporate treasury money will move back into prime funds uh, because of the uh, the floating NAV and the and probably more importantly the uh, the the fees and gates uh, feature. Uh, and then, you know, Debbie's absolutely right. You know, the, 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 the current size of the, of the prime fund universe, um, you know, is also a, a material constraint. So, um, so then the question becomes, you know, to, to when, you know, to corporate treasurers, as Tony suggested, you know, um, start to take, uh, I think, uh, you know, get their pencil out and really start to, uh, you know, do the calculations and figure out how much money they're leaving on the table sitting in a, Sitting in a, a government fund, and and do they you know, do they have the cash forecasting wherewithal to to start to more effective effectively segment their cash, maybe maybe putting it into uh, you know SMAs or some other maybe you know uh, you know an ultra short bond fund, and we think some of that will happen. Sure, as it, absolutely. You know, as it relates to European money fund reform, you know, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you know Debbie's absolutely right. I think the we we don't see uh, a, a U.S. money fund reform redux. We don't see we don't you know we're not anticipating the the massive flows that you saw from uh, prime you know prime CNAV funds to to government funds. I mean the you know the uh, the, the uh, you know the surveys that we've done with uh, corporate treasurers indicates that the L LVNAV uh, uh, product um, seems to be the one that's most potentially most interesting to them. So, uh, you know, I think that you know, I think that will probably serve as uh, sort of the uh, you know the, the the preferred alternative for uh, what is currently a prime uh, a prime CNAV fund. The sure. other thing, the other thing I think is interesting is that there's also a um, uh, there is an also a, a, a government CNAV option uh, under the new EU rules. Um, but you know, one of the things that we've tried to point out is that you know, you know, there's there's a wide disparity in terms of credit quality within the sovereign, you know, within among sovereign issuers within within the EU. So just because it's a government money fund doesn't mean you know the credit quality is necessarily you know what one would think about when they invest in a in a government money fund. You know, unless unless of course you know it carries a rating. So um, I think sure. that, that's really all all I all I would say on that. That's a lot. I like to be permanently lost to the prime universe. Uh, I'm going to use that more and more often. It's some sort of, yeah, <laughs> Tony's saying Star Trek. It's some sort of physics law. I forgot what it was, conservation <laughs> of energy or something like that. Uh, Michelle Price, the Associate Policy and Technical Director with the Association of Corporate Treasurers. Um, Debbie and Roger took a lot out of your out of your mouth, I'm sure, regarding CNAV, LVNAV. Um, not just you know the, the the changes here that are potentially happening in North America, but also those that are happening in the eurozone. What what do you think all this means to a corporate treasurer? Let me start with that. Um, well, well, first of all, Kevin, um, I just concur with what Roger and Debbie are saying that uh, we are expecting that most CNAV, that most of the money that's currently sitting in CNAV, constant net asset value funds, will move into these LVNAV funds. Mm -hmm. um, another point I would make is what I'm hearing is that there'll probably be a uh, five to ten basis point decrease in uh, expected return on these types of funds, um, and that's really because the, because of the tighter liquidity rules, the shorter duration, and it's expected that because they can only op operate in this uh, 20 basis point band. Um, that they're going to be investing in lower risk securities. So mm -hmm. we will, um, we're anticipating a, a, a fall in return on that. What does mm -hmm. it mean to the corporate treasurer? Well, um, a corporate treasurer needs to go back to their policy documents and, um, and, and work out whether the current policy as it stands allows them to invest in a low volatility net asset value fund. Um, right. it, it will behave you know, as a constant net asset value fund, but there is a risk that um, that it, it has to convert to a VNAV um, because of the volatility in in the um, in its return. So, corporate treasurers need to look at their policy. If um, their policy doesn't allow it currently, and I'm ex actually expecting that um, 
for quite a number of UK treasurers, it, it possibly won't, then they will need to go through the process of educating their board um, in order to uh, allow or to change their policy to allow for a product like this. And so part of the, the um, challenge of, of the money market fund market and, and uh, professional bodies such as ours is we need to educate the treasurers in order for them to educate their board. Perfect. That's exactly that's exactly what uh, what I think we're hearing is is you know it's one thing for a, a treasurer uh, to educate you know not just their finance function but also the board, but it's incumbent on all of us that are participants in the industry, the the money market funds themselves, uh, folks like consultants like Treasury Strategies to educate those treasurers on what the implications are. And I think this webinar is one of those things. Um, obviously, if anyone that's attending today has you know, further questions about this, please let us know. There's a little box in the corner. You can just say, hey, remember what you are talking about? I need more information on that. We'll know what you mean. So. Uh, hey, Kevin. Yeah, go ahead, Roger. I, I would just chime in that uh, Fitch just published a, a, a EU money fund reform made easy interactive tool that's available on our website. Uh, so if anybody, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's a very, I think, easy and, as I said, interactive way to kind of understand what the, what the key changes are. So if anyone's interested. Uh, that's perfect. Start. That's great, Roger. I, uh, I didn't know that myself, so I'll be the first one to be uh, Googling that when we get off the call here and, and take a look at it. Thanks, Roger. Um, Let's 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 turn to a new topic here. Uh, you know, I, we've been thinking about this and talking about this for a while. Um, for the last few years, we were talking about an interest rate liftoff and and other issues that are of top of mind to, to our corporate treasury audience. And over the last few weeks, we've been thinking about where's all this volatility. Um, you know, if I go back and look at like the June Fed meeting minutes, you know, it shows the officials they were expecting their balance sheet reduction plans to have a limited impact on the markets. The Fed was beginning to shrink its four and a half trillion dollar pile of treasuries and mortgage bonds pretty soon. And everyone's predicting that to well, not everyone. The prediction is is that will happen sometime between the end of the summer and the beginning of late fall, which is depending on where you live in the you know in North America that makes a big difference i would guess between september and october but i'm seeing all these these uh articles i'm hearing all these questions around what's going on with the european central bank you know uh a reversal in bond sentiment there you see a big article from greg ip uh maybe a week or two ago on i think the title was white soaring assets and unemployment low unemployment means it's time to start worrying and he's making an argument for a potential a bear market and, and possibly a recession. Uh, but we're not actually seeing the volatility in the marketplace. We're not seeing everyone saying jump into X asset class, which is generally a, uh, a trigger to go the other direction. So Debbie Cunningham, let me start with you on this. What's going on? Where is all the volatility at? Well, I think to some degree, Kevin, there's a lot of talk about volatility to try to keep markets at reasonable rates. Yeah. So, you know, volatility to me is a concern when there's overvaluation. Um, that's when it's most most of a concern. I mean, volatility can be, you know, in a cash product, it's necessarily not what you want. Uh, right. But, you know, volatility in a longer-term product is acceptable as long as you have the appropriate time frame. Um, it's the overvaluation side of it, I think, that, that, that causes concerns. Um, and I believe, to some degree, that's all the talk around volatility is to try to keep some of the overvaluation out of both the longer term fixed income market as well as the equity markets. And, and by both of those, I mean U.S. centric right. as well as global. I mean, I think there's a, a key effort by, you know, almost, almost going back to, you know, what something you said in your opening remarks from a Fed speak perspective, maybe not as much the Fed, but others um, who are attempting to, by talking about it a lot, try to keep a lid on some of the, um, you know, the, the over potential overvaluation that could be, you know, creeping into the market in what ultimately has been fairly benign, um, you know, economic and market conditions. Sure. And Fed speak is your term, I think. Uh, well, at least that's what I'm attributing it to. Um, and when I say, and I assume when other people, uh, you know, use that phrase, they're talking about not just how the Fed is communicating with markets, but also why they're making the the comments that they are to manage expectations. Um, and that's exactly oh. it. It's, it's rare that a Fed speaker yeah. has a comment if there's not a reason for it. 
<laughs> right, and and we've seen, yeah, exactly, and that's changed over the course of my professional career from Greenspan saying that he didn't want anyone to understand what he said to Bernanke and now Yellen being very, very, uh, well, not very, very, but let's just say clear, more clear uh, yeah. around uh, their expectations. Roger, what uh, what else is out there that we're not talking about right now that may actually uh, aggravate volatility in the markets? Well, like uh, a, a war on the Korean Peninsula might do it. <laughs> Don't say that out loud. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Roger. No, I mean, you know, I I I think uh, you know, I think uh, right now, the, as as Heavy said, the the Fed is trying to signal very clearly, uh, you know, what their intentions are. They seem just. I think they have a bit of a conundrum with the low the low inflation, um, but despite that, I think they uh, they 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 are trying to communicate communicate very clearly that they're going to be uh, be very measured and cautious, but in trying to bring rates back to a you know a more a more normal level. But you know, you ask why why aren't we seeing the volatility? I think the reality is you know um, it's it's all the all the cash that uh, that you know you guys showed on your slides and. Um, and and the fact that we have very very low policy rates, uh, uh, both in real and and nominal terms, uh, we calculate that uh, there's close to 10 trillion dollars of sovereign debt that's still trading at negative at negative yield. So um, so uh, you know I, I I think that has an awful lot to do with uh, why the markets seem to be able to climb the wall of worry. Yeah, for sure. Michelle, uh, we talked a little bit about volatility. What are your thoughts there? Well, um, over here in the UK, we, we are edging uh, closer to an interest rate increase. Um, the Bank of England, their, their Monetary Policy Committee met in June, and it was interesting that three of eight members actually voted for an increase. Um, you know, in previous months, it's been, uh, or previous quarters, it's been one of eight. Um, voting for an increase. So we're definitely moving in that direction. I mean, an increase in interest rates is, is justified uh, because they're trying to keep inflation in check. And, you know, inflation is currently sitting at about 2.9% um, here in the UK, but the Bank of England's target is, is 2%. But it's interesting because um, it, it's a real balancing act uh, since Brexit for these... Um, you know, interest rate setters because they're really trying to uh, keep uh, inflation in check, you know, and it's import fueled inflation because of the currency, and, and but provide support to the economy um, because there's so much uncertainty uh, and there's been a huge squeeze on household income. And we've seen a slowdown in, in GDP. Um, that's, that's really begun. So it's, it's you know, it, yes. We are expecting an interest rate increase when still uncertain, but it's it's sooner rather than later. Yeah, absolutely. And and you bring up Brexit, which is kind of the I don't know if I want to say the elephant in the room. It's kind of too soon to know what Brexit looks like, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I mean, from a corporate treasurer's perspective, it's you know it's really still uh, too early. Most corporate treasurers that we talk to, they're still in wait and see mode. Um, they're planning, um, but they really haven't put anything into uh, action yet. And what they're looking at is they're trying to understand how will Brexit impact the business strategy and therefore the knock-on impact to the financial strategy, which is the, the corporate treasurer's area. So that's one focus. And then the second focus uh, that the corporate treasurers have is, well, what is happening to my banks and their strategy? Um, that's that's a big issue as well. Great, thanks, Michelle. Roger, your thoughts on Brexit? Uh, no, I, I would just echo it's 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 very hard to to develop scenarios when um, you know when you don't really know what the final uh, agreement's going to to look like. So I mean, uh, you know, somebody somebody once said, you know, Brexit means Brexit, but nobody knows what Brexit means. So, uh, right. So, the severely uh, adverse scenario, I think, is what we would call it right now. Yeah, I think, you know, if you, uh, you know, um, I think for planning purposes, probably the best you can do is plan for the worst and hope for the best. Yeah, yeah. Debbie Cunningham, your thoughts on uh, on Brexit? Well, you know, I do think that, that, that certainly the U.K. is not going to be shut out of world trade, um, but there will be some 
you know, uh, I, I think it will have some impact on on worldwide GDP. Having said that, you know, the UK has 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 you know picked up and 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 grown you know pretty nicely, nicely better than it had been pr prior to the vote. Um, I, I think there's just a lot of discussion and debate at this point about what the right answers are. And, you know, as was said by Michelle, as was said by Roger, uh, it's, it's very questionable at this point. But the one thing that I would note is um, from a, a, our own UK office perspective, uh, several people there are very active in some of the negotiations and discussions around European money market fund reform. And they are definitely receiving, as Brits, a much different response and attitude toward them in those discussions post-Brexit, and pretty much more so this year since the regulations have finally been passed when they're talking about Brussels discussions um, than they have before. So there's definitely a slight bias against the Brits in those what would be more broader-based European um, kinds of, of, of reforms. Interesting. Thank you, Debbie. Uh, and, and actually, thank you so much to everyone who's participated in today's panel. Uh, Debbie Cunningham, the Chief Investment Officer with Federated Investors. Michelle Price, the Associate Policy and Technical Director with the Association of Corporate Treasurers. And Roger Merritt, the Managing Director with Fitch Ratings. Uh, on behalf of Tony Carfang and our panelists, thank you so much for listening in today. As usual, a link and a copy of today's materials will be shared with all the registrants in just a few days. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to contact me or any of our panelists at our respective emails. And, and I want to remind you before we wrap up that if you if you could, uh, especially those of you in, in the United States, type Congress in that QA box for instructions on how to email your reps regarding money market fund reform that Tony discussed earlier. Thank you so much to everyone who attended, and we will see you again in October for our corporate cash web briefing. In the meantime, enjoy your summer.